here this morning. Can I click this? Am I okay to click and pull up? I'm not getting an answer, so I'll try. I'm not ready. But uh, it's good to see everybody here this morning. I want to welcome you if you're visiting with us and not here on a regular basis. We thank you for your attendance today. And uh, today we are talking about the subject of prayer. I think that the worship service provides for Christians a a breath of fresh air, if you will, because our lives consider so many different things. There are so many different caveats, so many different things that we go through on a day-to-day basis, and if if you're not careful, it's easy for us to get overwhelmed with life. It's easy for us to even become frustrated with life. So many, uh, so many people doing things their own way. So many people not following God's law. So many people not giving regard to other people, to, to the way God wants them to live. And we get frustrated with that. But then comes Sunday. A time where we can set aside everything else that is worldly. We can come together in this building and for a few hours... We can forget about everything else. We can remember that God is the one that we give our lives to. He is the one that our allegiance belongs to. And we remember, we are reminded that all of the other frustrations, all the other things of life are of no eternal consequence. And it's a breath of fresh air. But then you have the other side of the spectrum. So many people don't attend the worship service. So many people don't understand what the worship service is all about and why they need to engage their lives and their minds and their hearts in worship to God. But yet they want to find God. They seek all over the place. They're looking for God, looking for meaning, looking for happiness in this life. And they're looking for God in everything, but they don't find Him because they look for God in all the wrong places. Some people believe it or not, try to find God at the bottom of a bottle. Some people try to find God in drugs. Some people try to find God in thousands of dollars worth of counseling sessions. And yet they go away feeling helpless because they still haven't found God. You know why people like that do not find God? Because they're looking in all the wrong places. I'm mindful of the Tootsie Pop commercial on TV during this time of year. You've got this little boy. He walks around. He's trying to to get to the Tootsie Roll center of a Tootsie Pop. And so he goes to all of these different figures. this, This owl, this tortoise. He tries to find the Tootsie Roll center of the Tootsie Pop. He gets to the owl and he says, Mr. Owl, how many licks does it take to get to the Tootsie Roll center of a Tootsie Pop? The owl says, well, let's find out. One, two, three. And he takes a bite out of it. The boy was looking for the answer in all the wrong places. The best thing for him to do was start licking that Tootsie Pop and figure out for himself. So many people are searching for God in all of the wrong places. And that's why they can't find Him. And so I want to begin today by talking about this. God can be found through prayer. I want us to look at Psalm 36. I accidentally told JT earlier, Psalm 142, it's actually uh, Psalm 141 is the passage I want us to look at, verses 1 and 2. But nevertheless, Psalm 142 is a great uh, psalm on prayer too. It's just not the one that I wanted to, to have read. But Psalm 36 or excuse me, not Psalm 36, but Psalm 32 and verse 6. Psalm 32 and verse 6 says this. This is the prayer that's all about forgiveness of sins, all about repentance and confession. And it says this, Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach Him. Seek God in a place where He may be found. If we can't find God in the worship service, where in the world are we going to find Him? I mentioned earlier, we we come to the worship service to get out of the world, to remind ourselves what, what is most important in this life. What are the things that are of an eternal consequence? 
So if we can't find God here, where in the world can we be found? Seek God where he may be found. And that's through prayer is how we seek him. But this passage does not say anything about the worship service. And some may be wondering, well, well, this doesn't say anything about the worship service. So how do I know I can find God at the worship service and specific, specifically find him in prayer at the worship service? Well, in walks Psalm 141, verses 1 and 2. It says, O Lord, I call upon you. Hasten to me. Give ear to my voice when I call to you. Let my prayer be counted as incense before you, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. What is incense? When you're talking about the old law, incense represented the people's prayers going up to God, didn't it? We know that because of Revelation chapter 5 and chapter 8. The Christians' prayers, they were struggling, but they prayed up to God and it was represented as incense going before God as a pleasing aroma to Him. And what's the evening sacrifice? It's part of the daily sacrifices that were offered in worship to God. Seek God where He may be found. If God can't be found here, and if he can't be found when we pray together here, then where can he be found? Remember what we talked about earlier about people maybe trying to find happiness and find God in thousands of dollars of counseling sessions. I love Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Because Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 is, gives a, a, a description of our Messiah, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And two of those descriptions it's given are counselor and prince of peace. Why is Jesus Christ my savior? Why is he my counselor? Why is he my prince of peace? Because the only place I find peace is through him. We'll talk more about that here in just a little bit. But He's my counselor. He's my prince of peace. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3, Paul describes God as the God of all comfort. We connect with God here at the worship service through prayer because God wants to be found. He has made himself readily available to each of us here today because he wants to be found. That leads me to this. God's house is a house of prayer. Hollywood does not do a very good job at communicating biblical truths well, but I believe they do well at this. I understand the, the church building is not, it's just a building to accommodate us for worship. But I believe each of us should look at the church building in a different way. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I think it was last weekend, we put up our Christmas decorations. And after we put up our Christmas decorations, we watched Home Alone. It's Sarah's favorite movie of all time. So we watched it together. And I love how Kevin walks into that church building towards the end of that movie. And he's feeling down about himself. I mean, he's just made his family disappear. And he's feeling down about himself. So he goes to the church service to try and feel better. And then, then he finds that man that supposedly murders people with a shovel. And they sit down and they start talking. And that man says something that's very valuable, I think. He says, this is the place to be when you're feeling bad about yourself. If we can't feel connected to God and the church building, where can we be connected to God? Because what did Jesus say? I want to reference Mark 17 and verse 11. We won't turn there. I want us to look at the passage in Matthew 21. You can go ahead and start turning there if you want to. But Mark chapter 17 and verse 11, Jesus tells the Pharisees, He says, My house, He's quoting uh, Isaiah 56 and verse 7, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. That all nations there is significant, isn't it? Because in Isaiah 56, Isaiah is talking about the salvation of all people through the Messiah. Not just the Jews, but all people will have the opportunity to connect with God. Because his house is a house of prayer for all nations. Now with that in mind, go to Matthew 21. 
Because Matthew 21 gives us a little bit more information. This is where Jesus cleanses the temple, by the way. He goes in and he sees some things that he does not like and he's provoked to take action. And as we begin reading in verse 12, it says this, Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the table of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. The temple ought to be a place where everybody can come. All the Jews, all of God's people, they can come to the temple, they can pray, they can offer sacrifices, they can worship, and they can feel connected to God, but some people were robbed of that connection. Apparently, some people, and so so it goes, that they may have been overcharging for some of the sacrifice or from some of the animals of sacrifice. Maybe that's what was going on. But it seems in this context to go a lot deeper than that. It seems that they are robbing people, maybe overcharging, but only certain people can have these sacrifices. If you only have a certain amount of money, or maybe you have certain credentials, whatever it seems like, people are being robbed for whatever reason from their connection with God. And notice what happens in verses 14 and 15. They're robbing people of their connection with God, and yet who walks in the door? And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And so what did the chief priests do? When the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna, Son of God, they were indignant. Not only are they robbing people of, God's, uh, of their connection to God, but when Jesus offers a way for them to connect, they get angry about it, upset. That word indignant is very emphatic. It's not just they got upset. It's not just they didn't like it. They were angry at Jesus for giving the people a connection to God. Are we guilty of robbing others, or ourselves of a connection to God. Sometimes we can rob other people of a connection to God, and sadly this happens in the New Testament. Remember James chapter 2, verses 1 and following? We won't read it for the sake of time, but you've got a scenario where there's poor people coming into the assembly, and the rich people are saying, hey guys, you sit over here. They've got designated seats for the poor people can all connect on the same level with that kind of distinction being made, with that kind of division being made. You go to 1 Corinthians and you start reading chapters 12 through 14. It's all about the worship service. But in chapter 14, you've got people saying, well, if you're not a tongue speaker, then you're somehow inferior to those that are speaking in tongues. And what does Paul say? That's not the way things work. Tongue speaking is not the greatest gift of all because a tongue speaker is nothing if there's not someone to interpret the language of the tongue speaker. What's the great, greatest gift of all, Paul says? 1 Corinthians 13, the greatest gift is love. Even in the early church, you've got Christians being robbed of their opportunity to connect with God. And sadly, it can still happen today. Let's remember that we all have the exact same connection to God. Now here's what I don't mean. What I don't mean is this. I don't mean that everybody is uh, uh, praise something. Let me say it this way. I don't mean that we all uh, connect with God in uh, in, uh, our prayers concern the same thing. Let me say it that way. Because my prayers as an adult are not going to be about the same things as the prayers of a teenager or the prayers of a poor person are probably not going to be about the same things as the prayers of a rich person. You're probably not going to hear a poor person thank God for all the material blessings that he has, because he doesn't have all of those material blessings like the rich people do. But here's what I do mean. We don't take all of the teenagers and put them in one room and say, you have your own prayer service. All the adults, you go over here and have your own prayer service. The poor, we go over here and have our own little prayer service. That's not the way we do things because we all have the same connection to God. And we all pray to Him with the same heart 
and in the same respect. But sadly, in the early church, we find people forgetting that scenario and robbing one another of a connection with God. We can even be guilty of robbing ourselves of a connection with God. Jesus brings this to the table in Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. He gets down on the Pharisees. He says, When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Some people rob themselves of a connection with God because they make prayer all about themselves and less about God. I've been guilty of doing this. Ever since I was a little boy, wherever my dad was preaching or wherever we were going to church, there's always been a person that prays a long prayer. I timed a prayer one time when I was a kid, seven minutes long. I timed it. And every time I saw that guy get up and walk to the front to lead a prayer, I thought, oh, here we go, this is going to be a long one. And I would shift in my seat, I would lean back, and I would get ready to get comfortable because I knew it was going to be long. Not once did I ever hear anything that person said because I made prayer all about myself. How many times do we choose somebody that's going to lead the prayer? We've got to have somebody that leads a good prayer. We've got to have somebody, somebody that's eloquent, somebody that really knows what they're talking about. We can't have a little 10, 15 second prayer. It should not matter who leads the prayer as long as the heart and the connection with God is made. But yet we can be so guilty in the worship service of robbing ourselves and other people of that connection to God. And so what's prayer all about then? We, can't, we, we find God in the worship service through prayer. Find God through prayer wherever we are, understand that. But specifically for the sake of this lesson, in the worship service we find God through prayer. We do it because God's house is a house of prayer. And so, can you click me? Um, my clicker's not working. Let me say this. Prayer and fellowship go hand in hand. I don't get on televangelists very often, uh, but this is one of the places where I can't help it. Because here lately, especially during COVID-19 and things, we have been seeing, can you click me please? Where we, have been, um, where we have been seeing these like 30 second commercials where people have, uh, they, they say, well, do you need peace? Pray this prayer and you'll find peace. God will give you this peace. Jesus will give you this peace. And I think that can never be the case. Because what's going on, if they do pray that prayer, if they do decide to pray that prayer, what happens? They're still sitting on the couch by themselves. They have no clue what the Bible says about peace because they haven't been told. They have no clue what Jesus did to offer ultimate peace and be the prince of peace because they've never been told. They don't have a connection with God or anybody else because they're just doing what so-and-so said. A connection with God, a relationship with God, fellowship with God or His people is never based on what so-and-so said. It's based on what Scripture teaches us about the subject. And so, when we think about fellowship, what are some things that come to mind? Most of us, if you're like me, are going to think about a fellowship meal. We're going to line this table up with all kinds of food, and you better have a lot of fried chicken before it's gone, before half the line gets through. That's probably what we think about when we think of fellowship, but it goes so much deeper than that. We can have great ultimate fellowship through prayer. And I want us to close this morning by looking at, back one, by looking at these three things on the screen about fellowship through prayer. There's a lot more that we could say here, but number one, fellowship 
through prayer as worship has the power to mend relationships. Turn your Bibles to Job 42. Job 42. Job is a, is a book that I think many people in the church can summarize in its steps. Basically, Job is allowed by God to be tempted by Satan, and he loses all of his possessions, loses much of his family, and largely the book of Job is, is him crying out to God, complaining to him, because he doesn't understand why these things are happening to him. He never turns his back on God. He never loses his faith, but he, he cries out and complains because he doesn't understand what's going on. But then, in the midst of all of that, Job has three friends. Three friends that come to Job and say, you've got to repent. It's because you, you're seeing that all of these things are happening to you. It has to be. And Job says, claims he's never done anything. And so you've got all of these different problems, and so there's tension between Job's three friends and God. There's tension between Job and his three friends. There's tension between Job and God. But in chapter 42, it all comes together. And it's very interesting to learn how it all comes together. Begin reading with me in verse 7. Job 42, verse 7. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My anger burns against you, and against your two friends. For you have not spoken to me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now therefore, take seven bulls and seven rams, and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept his prayer, not to deal with you according to your folly. For you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite, went and did what the Lord had told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. How were Job and his three friends able to reconnect how were they able to have fellowship with one another? Only through prayer and worship. And that's what God told them to do. When we connect with each other at the worship service, man, relationships can be mended. Do you imagine if everybody came forward at the end of the worship service and confessed their sins? I've done what's wrong. I need prayers of the church. I need God to help me. Could you imagine the connection? that we would all have with one another. Not just because we confessed our sins, but because we were able to pray with one another. And we could know that our fellowship between God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, and each other was all brought to full circle. And the connection had been reborn. Fellowship through prayer has the opportunity to mend relationships. Secondly, prayer is worship. It gives us the opportunity to communicate to outsiders how we connect with God. We won't turn to this passage and read it. We'll just reference it. But in Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas get themselves arrested in Philippi. They get arrested. They get thrown in prison. They're put in stocks. And what are they doing at midnight? They're singing and praying to God. As they're singing and praying, this big earthquake comes, shakes the prison walls, knocks the door off its hinges. And the Philippian jailer runs in, and he just knows that everybody's going to be gone. So he draws his sword. He's about to kill himself. And Paul and Silas say, no, don't do that. We're still here, they said. And the Philippian jailer knew exactly what had happened and why it happened. So he fell on his knees. And he said, what do I have to do? to be saved. And what did it lead to? Not just the Philippian jailer, but the entire household of the Philippian jailer responded to the invitation, obeyed the gospel, and were baptized for the remission of their sins because Paul and Silas felt the need to pray and sing praises to God when they were in worship. There's no other way 
other than Paul and Silas sitting down with them and teaching them the gospel, that they would have been able to have a connection with God. It was the worship of Paul and Silas that taught them that con- or Paul and Silas that taught them that connection. And then finally, prayer as worship spreads understanding and edification. There's two passages I want us to view here. 1 Corinthians 14, we alluded to the section of 1 Corinthians uh, chapters 12 through, through 14 earlier. But Paul says something, and, and, and I mentioned uh, earlier as well about the, the relationship between the gifts and the, the tongue speakers and, and those that prophesy. And Paul's like, tongue speakers are nothing. Because if there's not somebody to interpret the tongue speaker... Nobody would know what the tongue speaker said because he's speaking a foreign language. It has to be interpreted in order for everybody to understand. Why is that important? It's important because of what Paul writes in verse 12. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. It's all about edification. It's all about everyone understanding what's going on so that they can be built up. What does that look like? Verses 13 and 14 shows us what it looks like. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. I can pray speaking in a different language, but if I have no clue what I'm saying, then it doesn't do anything for my understanding, Paul says. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, A prayer that has no understanding, but I will pray with my mind also. A prayer that understands everything that's being said. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. It must be done for building up. And quickly, there are, I encourage you to read my bulletin article because this is what I wrote my bulletin article on. This entire subject, there's so many places in the New Testament where prayer is connected to understanding what the Bible teaches. And here's just one other place. Ephesians 3, beginning in verse 14, For this reason I bow my knees, prayer, before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. When is the last time the person leading a prayer in worship prayed that everybody in the assembly would understand everything that went on. It doesn't happen. Some people don't understand because they're unchurched. They just don't have very much experience going to church and things, and it's going to kind of seem uh, hard for them to understand because of that. Some people don't understand because they're just too young. They really just don't, their, their cognitive abilities haven't progressed to the point where they can understand what's trying to be communicated. But could you imagine what happens when everybody in the assembly says, I get it now. I understand what's going on. I have a friend that for years was looking for the truth. He went to just about every church you can think of, talked to just about every person he knew that was religious, And he kept coming up short because the things that he was learning and the things that he saw in the Bible just did not connect. And then he entered a worship service one day and he got it. He didn't get it because of what the preacher said. He didn't get it because he started reading his Bible on that Sunday morning and it made sense to him all of a sudden. He got it because he saw the way the congregation worshipped. And he said, this is different than anything I've ever experienced. He saw the heart of everything that was involved, and he got it. And he eventually became a missionary in a foreign country. The worship service 
changed him and converted him to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You think fellowship in the worship service is important? Fellowship is not just sitting in the pews. It's the way we connect with God during the service. And one of the brightest ways we connect with God in the service is when we pray together. We have somebody leading the congregation in prayer. We're all engaging our minds and our hearts in what is being said and we're all carrying that prayer up to God. And it allows us to be connected to one another, to our Savior, to our Spirit, and to God. And so here's the question I want to leave you with today. How are we engaging ourselves during the prayer portion of worship? It's easy to get distracted during prayer because, let's say, those of you that have small children, maybe the, the child starts crying and you want, it, you want the child to be quiet during the prayer and, and you get distracted that way. Maybe you just minimize the importance of prayer and worship because I do this all the time. I pray every single day and it just seems like another prayer when we come together for worship. But that's not what it is. Congregational prayer is different than individual prayer. Because it's several people praying all at one time and we're being guided into a proper connection and a proper understanding of God and what we are doing. So as we pray this morning and uh, for the remainder of our lives in the church, from now on, let's think about prayer as not just something else that we do because the first century Christians did it. Let's think about something, it being something that we do because God said, my house, which in New Testament terms is the church, my house is a house of prayer. If you're here this morning, and maybe you're not living your life the way that you need to, and you need to ask for prayers for the congregation, respond to the invitation today and let us help you. There may be someone here today that wants to respond to the invitation and put Christ on in baptism. They're stained in sin. And the only way for them to, to reconnect with God is to have that sin washed away in baptism. But they haven't done it yet. And they want to do that. If you need to be a part of the church and, and, and have your sins washed away, let God add you to His church today by doing that as we stand and sing.